lecturing us, one of the other Children's Center directors. So we are so happy to have our first Tech Talk. And please join me in welcoming our colleagues, Dr. George Norman and Dr. Ellen Hall, who are going to talk to us a little bit about play. So. Thank you. I'm checking. The, I guess I hear this is picking up. Great. Well, what a better place to talk about play than right here at Google. We've all admired the ascent of Google and Googlers, so we couldn't be more thrilled. On this auspicious day, your earnings probably are out now, because <laughs> on the West Coast, it's 4 o'clock. So if you are logging in, we understand uh, to, you're checking uh, the success of your wonderful company. So here we go, skipping your way to Harvard. Uh, we could have called this skipping your way to UCLA or Berkeley or Stanford or Google, but we thought we would choose neutral turf by putting the word uh, Harvard in this title. Uh, as uh, Sherry said, I'm George Foreman, my partner, Ellen Hall. We co-founded a company called Videotives. We'll say a little bit about that. Uh, later, but it's not really an infomercial. We're here to talk about uh, play. <coughs> Excuse me, a little laryngitis here. Okay, skipping your way to Harvard. Uh, on the one hand, parents, teachers, uh, value play as a source of joy. Uh, but on the other hand, we're a little ambivalent about it. We sometimes think it might be a distraction away from uh, what's really relevant to learning. But uh, can one play and still reach difficult objectives, uh, such as getting into Harvard or being hired by Google? Uh, there is a strong possibility, and research suggests that play actually uh, might be essential uh, to reach challenging uh, objectives. Uh, we propose that this component play is necessary for both success and understanding. And we're going to differentiate these terms as we go along. The value of play does not diminish as one leaves childhood. Uh, let me lay out a few rather condensed uh, statements. We call them anchor statements. And we're going to have a Q&A session uh, the last hour, or maybe a little less than an hour. So if these key statements, or these anchor statements might help you bullet or what you might want to ask questions about. That's why we did it this way. A play, what is it? One definition of play, it's an attitude. It's not really a particular activity. It's an attitude of casualness or lightheartedness. Uh, success, on the other hand, is an achievement. And it's achieved by practice. And it's, de it's defined more by attaining goals. Understanding, on the other hand, is achieved in a different way. It's not achieved so much by practice, but by reflection. And it requires both knowing what something is and knowing what something is not. So play is an attitude toward the world, a way of seeing and being, an active search for possibilities. So here, imagine a child, and you'll see how this fits into the title. Uh, imagine a child on her way to a neighbor's house with her parents. How does she move? Uh, does she just go straight down the sidewalk? Not hardly. If you watch children, and I'm sure you have, uh, they skip, uh, they hop, they walk with one foot off the curb, one foot on the curb. You've seen it. A uh, crack in the sidewalk, they make an exaggerated jump over the crack as if it's going to open wide. So they pretend. Uh, and the child expands walking to variations that are telling but are not actually necessary. In a moment, I'll discuss how such play leads to understanding, which is a little paradoxical, but it does. Uh, but first, let me distinguish uh, success uh, from understanding, because this is critical. One can successfully reach a goal without truly understanding what one has required to do. A boy, such as young David, may spin a stone in a sling and successfully hit his target. Each time he releases, 
uh, the sling. The success, if you really understand physics, requires a release at around 2 o'clock, if he's spinning it in a counterclockwise way, to hit a target that's directly ahead uh, 12 o'clock. Yet, in, uh, as Piaget's research has shown, that when asked about this event, most adolescents, uh, young adults, will say that they release uh, this string at 12 o'clock, as you see in this diagram, which is not correct. So you can be successful at spinning the stone, but not really understand uh, what you've done. And to understand, you need to reflect. You need to sort of rule out uh, the contradictions. You sort of invent the correct performance. You don't really observe, as Piaget would say, you would invent. And upon reflection, our young David would realize that the stone could not change so abruptly. Let's see if this little gizmo works. The motion will not change abruptly here. Well, why would motion unfettered uh, make a right angle? So that's, in a way, contradicts other things the child knows. So uh, to understand, David would reason that the path of the travel uh, is y but not x, that this is how it must work, and this, even though it was my intuition, uh, is wrong. So the reflection on performance yields understanding, and success uh, precedes it. So now back to play, a lightheartedness and understanding. How does the lightheartedness of play benefit understanding? Play is a form of acting out what might appear to be unnecessary, uh, pushing your food around on the plate, <laughs> Uh, deliberately putting your coat on backwards. I'm still talking about young children, so don't get worried that, oh, you hadn't done that today. Uh, uh, doing wheelies with their stroller. Uh, this is what a video you're about to see. And another video we're going to show you, uh, kicking the air with your foot after you've thrown a ball with your arm. So let me sort of unpack uh, these a little bit, playing with the unnecessary. Watch this child has been pushing his stroller all over the neighborhood with four wheels flat on the ground. Uh, this is Foreman home video, sorry, but uh, it exemplifies what I want to say. Uh, watch how he tilts the stroller, uh, perhaps to add interest to his work. So you'll even see him pause like, you know, what can I do now? And he, he's never done that before, no particular reason for it. So now he's kind of done a wheelie with this stroller. And watch how he now understands that to really stabilize it, he kind of hooks the handles under his arms uh, to stabilize that horizontal uh, position. In time, uh, he receipts the stroller, four wheels on the ground. And at that point, he might look at that ordinary way of pushing in a new way. It's not tilting it back. So what does it yield to push it forward? Oh, I see. Now I know why it works better with four wheels on the ground. The first two wheels keep it from tilting forward. It stabilizes it. And if he hadn't have playfully experimented with the unnecessary, he may have continued on his merry way uh, successful, but not particularly knowledgeable. Now, here's another clip. Uh, and I'd like you to watch how this child, after he uh, throws a ball at the end, how he lifts his, I believe it's his right leg. Uh, he first kicks the ball, for some, and he's been doing this for some minute, and then later in the video, he throws the ball a uh, pretty good distance. But the throw is not the kick. And perhaps to express this contrast, he raises his leg in thin air. So let's look at this little clip. It's so here he it. kicks it, and he kicks it pretty well. Yay. <laughs> and now when he throws it, this is a few minutes later, 
You see? It's a really good one. Uh, and I don't know why he did that. For sure, I mean, I don't, but I'm going to speculate that he was saying something here. Uh, the ball is way over there, and I didn't kick it. Now, that's an interpretation, uh, but I'm a child watcher, and I think uh, that's my uh, particular intuition. So I think he's making a statement that the throw is not uh, the same thing that he did before, which was kick. So by considering what a throw is not a children, this child comes to a more complete understanding of what the throw is. So to review, play helps children understand the necessary versus the unnecessary, as we saw with uh, the stroller, and to consider what something is not, we saw with the thrower. Such is the structure of understanding. To watch a toddler, and perhaps a number of you have watched a toddler roll a ball down an incline, if you look carefully, what they do is they'll put it at the top of the incline and then they push it. Now, they don't have to push it, they could just release it. But young children are not sure uh, about where motion comes from. They often think it comes from me, you know, the, the center of the universe. They push it. Uh, so, why do they push it? Or what might come next? If you look closely, uh, you will, uh, like I said, you'll see that uh, they, they use their hand. But after a while, they start backing off, uh, taking a more lighthearted approach to this, and they'll do things that, again, aren't necessary. Uh, they'll release it. And in releasing it, they'll notice the ball rolls by itself. Uh, of course, if the ball is at the top of the incline. They also, as they are in this playful mode, they'll put it at the bottom of the ramp and they'll throw it up and they notice it comes back down. Now, these are all discoveries for a young child. Uh, or if they have a cone, they put it at the top. It doesn't roll straight down. It surprises them. It rolls in an arc. So it's this playful mode that leads to all these Discoveries, But the question, I think kind of the epistemological question, is why not be content with success? I mean, when you pushed it down, it went down. Uh, why do you ever not just keep going, pushing it, pushing it, pushing it? Well, it's our species, I think. We have this uh, tendency to uh, reflect. It's, I think, very much part of our species. Like, what is the form of my play here? Uh, and so they uh, are motivated more by this lighthearted distance from the action. They're not trying to predict a particular effect and make it happen over and over again. They're uh, more lighthearted and trying to discover uh, things by doing the unnecessary, the superfluous, uh, the uh, engaging. So as the exception proves the rule, as what you do that's unnecessary proves what's necessary. So the skip defines the walk. So skipping is a good way to become a successful and knowledgeable applicant to Harvard. And Ellen and I are going to switch off on um, segments. So now it's Ellen's turn. OK. OK, so now, oh, is this one on? Now some more anchor statements, better, thanks, that outline the rest of our talk. Success without play will not yield understanding. Success without understanding will not create meaning and love of work. Understanding without sharing will not create quality. We will discuss each of these statements in turn, saving for last the role of digital video and the internet in sharing our understanding. With regard to the second statement, we want our children to be successful, but we also want them to love their work. This modern dilemma faces us all. How can we help our children attain their goals and at the same time love their work? Can we begin to recognize those situations in childhood that support and maintain this combination of work and joy? In this talk, we maintain that the answer lies in our understanding of play. Play allows learning to occur for the very reason that it contains joy. 
Children try new strategies and new variations because in play, success is not the issue. In play, the child seeks to express possibilities, not necessarily to improve performance. How many ways can I do this becomes more important than how do I do this effectively? And what do I know about this becomes more important than can I make this work? Of course, ult ultimately, play yields success, and the child's reflection on success yields understanding. But this is a complex process often passed over by adult eyes that only flit. We chose not to flit, but to slow down and look at the amazing subtlety of play. You will meet three more protagonists in our story, two children, Karen and Tyler, and a high school student, Frank, writing his admissions essay to Harvard. We will use their stories to explain how playfulness is beneficial to learning and success. So let's first watch Karen gluing small felt and plastic objects onto a two by four board. You will see how unhurriedly he works, relaxed, focused, not intense about his goals. At some point, Karen's casualness allows him to step back mentally and think about his work as a set of steps. Get glue, dab glue, get object, place object. This sort of detachment from the immediacy of his work allows him to modify these steps, if you will, recode the rules that he uses to generate the product. Without this casual detachment, Karen would not be able to reflect on the general structure of his actions and on the steps that he is using. Once he considers their structure, he begins to play with the rules and invents new ways to complete his goals. Okay, let's begin. Oh, there's no sound on this, so just to let you know. So you can see the... The glue is dabbed onto the two by four, and then carefully placing the item onto the glue. Then he reaches for the glue stick again, places a dab of glue at the other end of the two by four board. Very careful. Relaxed and focused, and he selects an item, but then changes his mind and selects an item that's similar to the one he already placed and places this item over the second dab of glue, and so that gives us a clue to that he is going to make, be making a symmetrical design. So if we stop the video or pause it and, and look at an animation, um, we can focus on Kieran's moves and how he eliminates steps. So here we have what we saw in the video, the glue, the item, the glue, the second item, and then he continues, each time reaches, reaching into the uh, bowl to get one dab of glue for one object. Ah, then at a certain point, he's going to eliminate, he notices he has a new strategy that he can add a second dab of glue to the glue stick and eliminate steps. Now he has two dabs of glue on his glue stick, and he proceeds. Glue, holding onto the glue stick, instead of picking up a new object, he puts down another dab of glue. And he doesn't go back. Once he's got this strategy in place, it's two dabs of glue, Item, item. Ah, but then he has a new strategy, and now he's figured that he can take the two items out of the bin and eliminate another step. So two dabs of glue and two items at a time. 
he creates a pair, and now he doesn't have to return to the supply bin. And again, he does, once he has the strategy in place, he doesn't go back. At each time a piece is placed, a second piece is placed in a symmetrical location. So it's not the point of this example that Kieran became more efficient in cutting out steps. The point is that Kieran began to treat his actions as subroutines. He was not simply engaged in a gluing activity. He was thinking about the motifs in his actions and how they related one to the other. So this stands toward action. This view from above defines play. In play, what is the form of my actions takes temporary precedence over what do my actions yield. But it's also interesting to note that Kieran's actions became more coherent and integrated as he worked. It is this tendency for play to help one integrate and make experience more coherent that leads you to Harvard and Google, skipping, hopping, and jumping over cracks. So we've discussed how play yields to understanding by this distance from the effects and looking at the form. Now we'll shift to how uh, playfulness also helps uh, uh, performance. So uh, play can improve performance. Uh, performing a set of action, be the player a child pretending to cut down a tree, and you'll see uh, Tyler pretend to cut down a tree, or um, an adult. Uh, writing their admissions essay uh, to college. Playfulness improves performance. Here are a few uh, more attributes I'd like to share with you about playfulness, and I'll use these particular attributes to uh, explain how playfulness can enhance performance, both of Tyler, the little boy pretending, and Frank, uh, the uh, high school senior writing, uh, junior, writing his essay. A play shifts uh, the what is to the as if. For the child, there is always an element of pretense in play. As uh, jumping over the cracks, uh, that in reality present no threat. It's just to pretend. Uh, when a playful frame of mind, uh, the adult uh, is not literal. Uh, they're as if oriented. The facts are embellished. Uh, beyond the literal to yield more feeling uh, and a metaphoric uh, expression. A playful frame of mind also delights in the occurrence of surprise. Uh, surprise is not treated as failure. Remember, success is not the issue. Uh, and surprise is treated as fun. Uh, for the child, the playful mind actually hopes that things will end up funny, uh, surprising. Uh, for the adults, say, uh, writing an essay, uh, you use surprise. It adds pause and causes the reader to reflect. A play thrives on flexibility uh, and the use of new combinations. For the child, if she uh, cannot knock the bowling pin down with her bowling ball, she'll go over and kick it uh, with her foot. Uh, so it's flexible. Everything is okay. Uh, if she doesn't have a toy car to motor across the carpet, she'll get a rectangular block and pretend that it's the car. It's this flexible uh, way of being uh, and add new, new com unusual combinations. For the adult, the willingness to consider any and all combinations yields a creative writing, creative solutions. I'm sure uh, this is rampant at Google. Uh, the brainstorming sessions here must be outstanding. The playful mind delights when it discovers or invents deliberate ambiguity. 
when two forms are compressed in one. For the child, it could be the lowly pun. Children go through this period where they think the pun is the funniest thing in the world. Uh, but then as we grow in our literary uh, skills, uh, we uh, is exchange irony uh, and other tropisms for uh, our writing uh, instead of puns, and we even become eloquent. So let me introduce you to Frank uh, and see how these attributes of play apply to uh, his writing. Uh, Frank decides to write about his experience uh, uh, as a competitive swimmer. Uh, this actually was a uh, essay that I got off of the Princeton Review website uh, to talk about uh, writing essays. It was kind of a tutorial. And it walks uh, the reader through the first draft and the second draft and what's different. So I'm going to use uh, this uh, final version to make some points about how uh, the uh, high school student's playfulness uh, improved his writing. Here we go with a portion of Frank's final essay. Uh, you don't have to read this if it's too far in the back to see. I'll read it here. The sun sleeps as the desolate city streets await the morning rush hour. Driven by an inexplicable compulsion, I enter the building along with 10 other swimmers, inching my way toward the cold, dark locker room of Menlo Park. One by one, we slip into our still, damp suits and run through the chill of the morning air. The cold air propels an eerie column of steam from the water's surface, producing the spooky ambiance of a werewolf movie. Well, you know, he's a high school junior, OK? Uh, but this is an improvement. Uh, next comes the shock. A head-first immersion into the tepid water sends our hearts racing and we respond with a quick set of warm-up laps. As we finish, our coach emerges from the fog. He offers no friendly accolades. I think Frank had a th thesaurus here. Uh, he offers no friendly accolades, just a rigid regimen of sets, intervals, and exhortations. OK. So that was the, by the way, he did get in Harvard. So you know, uh, it worked. Uh, the picture is not really Frank. Well, that's my son, Jed. <laughs> but I did it with his permission. <laughs> uh, how is Frank writing playful? How does his understanding of his craft result from this playful attitude? And remember, we're going to compare uh, what he did with what children do. So the whole idea is that children's play is a precursor to excellence uh, with other media when you're older. It's not uh, irrelevant. How might this playfulness improve his love of the writing process? Uh, to answer these questions, I will use the four attributes I just mentioned. After my comments on Frank's, Ellen will compare the playfulness of our college applicant to Tyler, the little boy who uh, buzzes his lips uh, to pretend he's cutting down a tree. All right, here we go. Shifting the what is to the as if. Frank thinks about the facts in his story and realizes that the um, end and of themselves are not that interesting. He plays with the exact details to create some emotional reaction in the reader. Instead of saying, uh, walking to the cold, dark locker room, he says, inching uh, my way. Now, Clearly, he wasn't inching. This is not literal. This is as if to create an effect, to show his ambivalence about uh, the practice. Uh, in his first draft, he said, the coach joins us later. But in the final draft, he says, our coach emerges from the fog. Again, uh, non-literal, but uh, adds motive and emotion to his writing. Playing with the element of surprise. Frank wants the reader to be actively engaged in the story. Therefore, he sets the reader up uh, to think about what's going to happen next. In a rather direct way, he says, next comes the shock. All right, well, what shock? And then he follows that 
uh, with the head first immersion into the cold water. Well, what they thought was cold. Playing with new combinations. Frank wanted the reader to reframe the swimming pool as more than some convenient and measured place to practice. Therefore, he combined the steam of the warm pool uh, with the eeriness of a misty swamp in a werewolf movie. Uh, and the juxtaposition of these two images helped Frank express, again, his ambivalence about the pool. A plane with compressed dualities. Frank understood that irony and paradox causes the reader to pause and to think. Instead of saying, I love to swim, but I hate to, he compressed this ambivalence into the phrase, inexplicable compulsion. This phrase captures his dual feelings about competitive swimming. He practices out of a need to do it, a compulsion, but not out of a reason to do it. It's inexplicable. The compressed expression and explicable compulsion presents these opposing feelings as living simultaneously uh, within him. That's what irony is, the holding of two opposing uh, facts or feelings, as opposed to just listing them one after another. Now, we saw this same structure with Karen, the child gluing doodads on the two by four. He compressed two actions into one when he got extra glue on the stick so he could use them for two uh, placements on the two by four. So this is a duality that he invented. And later, when he got to, um, next slide please, uh, got these two uh, plastic uh, doodads uh, at once, so the one and one become a pair. So this kind of structure, this mental structure, exists even in three-year-olds uh, when they're playing with things as mundane as gluing doodads on a two-by-four. If you really slow down and look at what children do, you begin to see their thinking. The structure of their action gives you insight into the rules they're using to generate uh, those actions. OK. to continue this discussion of children's play as a precursor to Frank's essay. I'll show you Tyler pretending to cut down trees with a chainsaw. You will see Tyler use an orange plastic tent stake as the pretend blade of a chainsaw to tell the story of tri tri trimming tree limbs. <laughs> Alliteration. Tyler buzzes his lips, loud at times, soft at times, even shifting into an idling noise between cuts. After you watch this delightful video clip, we will circle back to meet, make parallels to Frank. Here are a few things to note as you watch. How Tyler uses the retracting handle of a bicycle pump to simulate the felling of the tree. How he pretends that the chainsaw will not start and how the bicycle pump becomes part of the chainsaw when the tent stake is out of reach. Here we go.
sometimes it just won't start. Okay, so above all else, we see the cleverness and creativity of Tyler's play. How he invents symbols, modifies them, and communicates his thoughts through enactment. In a non-trivial sense, Tyler is writing a story. Let's look at some of the specifics of his play that reveal how his play uses thinking similar to Frank's, albeit in mime rather than in words. I'm sorry, am I? and hit the space bar. Uh, there's a little clip at the end where he pretends that the tent stake now is a leaf blower, and he goes around the floor uh, blowing imaginary leaves. Uh, but this is on our website. You can look at it. So, you have to clean up your mess when you're You've got to clean up your mess, <laughs> yeah. OK, so while the entire episode is pretense, parts of Tyler's play are truly out of the box. How is he? to represent the gradual process of cutting through a limb or a tree trunk. He slowly lowers the handle of the bicycle pump. He's asking us to think about how the chainsaw works. It does not lop off the limb in one swift move like a machete. It takes time. And even though the telescoping of the handle is not a literal version of a blade sinking deeper into a limb, the symbol does capture this element of time. The as if takes priority over the what is. There are a number of places where Tyler keeps us engaged in his story by throwing in a bit of surprise. Think back to his animated tug on the starter rope followed by no buzzing of the lips. He captured something funny by enacting a stubborn chainsaw that will not start. The playful mind is open to using different symbols to represent a story element. When Tyler could not reach the tent stake when he wanted to start the saw, he shifted the action to the base of the bicycle pump. And later, the part you didn't see, um, but you can, the, um, on the website, the tent stake itself became a leaf blower. This flexibility comes from his lightheartedness towards his goals. So again, there are many more examples of Tyler's inventiveness, but since we are going to move on, and if you'd like to learn more about the meaning of the video clips that we've shared, we invite you to visit us at www.videotips.com. So now we'll shift to uh, uh, our own professional development. Uh, we, transcend, we transition into this last area of consideration, which presents us with several questions. How can we both deepen our understanding of the value of play and share our new understanding with each other, with other parents, other teachers, colleagues, how do we all participate in this construction of expertise? I hope you felt uh, some of the power of digital video to slow down and uh, see children thinking, or as we like to say, see what children know. Because uh, when you slow down, it really reveals the high level thinking in children's play. But what if hundreds of people uh, could observe the same video and construct a shared meaning? Gradually, such video would become a definition of the abstract concepts that it represents, a social contract of agreed meaning, which is not so common, particularly in early education. Uh, we don't have many shared references, shared examples of even commonly used uh, standards, like the phrase you see in all state standards, uh, does child take risk, or does child show leadership? Or is this program a child-centered approach? We have so many different understandings of those terms, we don't really communicate well. Uh, we would propose that if we could share video clips, that video instantiation would solve this problem, at least of knowing what each other means. So let's show you the result of one project we did in our online course at Videotives, where a large number of people deconstructed a shared video uh, on child leadership. Uh, in, in this video, and Alan will walk you through this, uh, Hannah 
organizes a tea party, it's just delightful, uh, for her friends. Uh, she shows great skill in her leadership in recruiting players, uh, maintaining the flow of play, all the while maintaining and reestablishing her authority as a director of the play. The video clip has become a classic in early education. Uh, many early educators use this clip to show what they mean by the phrase shows leadership. This phrase is now both contextualized in the real flow of an authentic episode of pretend play, but it's also keyworded or abstracted to define the subskills of leadership. And I think that's where the real power comes in. Now, Ellen will present this episode in segments so that uh, she can pause and identify what these subskills are. Okay, meet Hannah. In this, our last video clip, uh, we, I, we'd like you to watch how three-year-old Hannah completely orchestrates a story about being sick and then having tea. She makes sure everyone has a part, while at the same time maintains her unchallenged role as the director. We will note her leadership skills as she sets the theme, recruits new players, makes adjustments when things don't work, and even finds a clever way to eject an adult who talks out of turn. <laughs> Guess who? <laughs> <laughs> Setting the theme. Hannah starts out telling Benjamin, and you need to get some rest, mommy. Later, she changes him into daddy. Benjamin immediately goes into the sick bay under the stairs. Watch how skillfully Hannah blends the pre-established role of a pretend dog into her theme. And you need to get some rest, Mommy. You need okay. to get some rest. Sleep on the blue pillow on your Sleep with your little baby. Puppy, is it all right if I give your baby to my friend? My mommy. Don't you love the way she pauses and waits for this pretend dog to answer in dog talk? My dog said you can follow me. Enforcing the theme, Hannah realizes that Benjamin has to be isolated for a reason. She explains that he has to wait for the doctor to come. When Benjamin tries to escape the boredom of sick bay, she gently pushes him back in and says, Stay in bed, Daddy. I have you a little chocolate, Dad. Ha, 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 ha. Dad, here you go. This will help you feel better. Doctor's going to be here at me. Okay. And now he's here. Go on in, Dad. No, don't come out. Stay in bed, Daddy. Recruiting more players. Hannah has promised Benjamin that the doctor will come. However, there is no person to play the role of doctor. Benjamin is getting tired of being in sick bay. She tries to recruit William to be the doctor, but William does not respond. What to do? making adjustments. Hannah knows that Benjamin will want to come out, but she has recently told him to stay in bed and have some food. So she devises a way to satisfy both Je Benjamin's desire to come out and her authority. She pretends that the doctor has instructed her to tell Benjamin to have his food at the table. The doctor said if you, if you want some food, you better sit at the table. See, everything's done sort of at her directive, go in, come out, so, but it's all in the context of the theme. Now, Dad, sit on this white chair, please. I'll push you in. 
You put yourself in. <laughs> She's cool, in. <laughs> She's in charge. Clarifying roles. The play has been proceeding for about 10 minutes now. George joins the play with an intention of bumping up the children's level of reflection on what they are saying. Soon after, William returns to the scene, and Hannah wants to be sure that she knows his role. After all, it just wouldn't do for the director to be out of the loop. William explains that he is the cooker. And I've been taking care of him. So he says, do a little sick. Uh, this is your dad in here behind the curtain? Yeah. You sick? That's... So what do you do to make him better? I don't know. But a doctor. Uh-huh. And what does the doctor do? The doctor makes you better. Two minutes? Yeah. Are you the doctor? I'm the makeup. Oh. Now that Daddy is feeling better, Hannah invites all to a tea party. She becomes the gracious host, pouring pretend tea in each person's cup. But in George's attempt to have Hannah think about time and space, such as how long one has to pour a full cup of tea, Hannah truly shows her ability to deal with demands. Everybody want a tea party? Yeah, let's have a tea party. This is how you should be able to pretend tea right there when you stand up. That's how much. Oh, I didn't get any. Oh, I'll tell you. Okay. Oh, but I have a big cup. I have a real big cup. I'm trying to uh, say if I have a big cup, then you need to hold the pot tilted longer. So it's time and volume, time and space. Uh, so th there was a method to my uh, madness here. This could be a little big Oh, okay. All right. And you, I can give them this. And you'll have this one. And now I will have this one. Now these things. And you could have to have this. Oh, this one. You saw the look. <laughs> Dealing with the spread of demands, George's request for more tea spreads to other players. William insists he has no tea. Hannah apologizes and pours the endless pot of imaginary tea into William's cup. But William, following in George's footsteps, insists that he only has a little bit. When George affirms that William needs some more tea, Hannah says coyly, Oh, I bet he does. Salute. Hello, hi, Daddy. Oh, I'm sorry. Everybody doesn't have them. I keep falling there. Keep falling them. Well, maybe. And a little bit. Hey, you got a little bit? Oh, he wants some more. Oh, I think he does. Thank you. Well, welcome. Cheers, Autumn. Cheers. Busted. There we go. Cheers. Ejecting the talky adult. <laughs> As George continues to ask the children to reflect on what they are saying, Hannah seems to grow in impatience with his presence. She cannot just ask George outright to leave, so she reminds all of the participants of their roles and assigns George the role of a sick patient. And as a sick patient, George must go to another part of the room. 
Daddy. 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 Perhaps she feels that if she had a chair of her own, her leadership role would be more tangible. Guess whom she asks to give her his seat. Can I sit in your chair? Sure. Can I, can I sit over here then? Sure. Okay. So, here we are. Is that better? On your chair. Bidding farewell to the talkie adult. In the end, George excuses himself and thanks the children for allowing him to play with them. Hannah, in words that might express some ambivalence about George's leaving, says, Come on, go on. And was that last gesture a gentle push out the door or a friendly pat on the leg? Okay. Well, I'm going to go and look at some of the other rooms. Thank you for letting me play with you. You can keep uh, right on going. Okay. I love your chocolate. You want candy. some of your lunch, carrot? You can, but the rice bowl. Come on, come on. I'll uh, come back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Come back. <laughs> back. <laughs> Hannah reconvenes her group, and the play goes on with William finishing his chocolate cake, and Benjamin is the pleasant pleasant beneficiary of Hannah, Hannah the host and William the cook. Hannah has shown she is truly a skillful leader. Hannah for president. <laughs> <laughs> she deserves a big hand. Uh, we love that clip. And like I say, we played this in an online course and we had a lot of back and forth about what it means and I think what you've seen is a distillation of that work. So there you see that a glib phrase such as child shows leadership uh, has been exemplified uh, through digital video, co-constructed by uh, many educators who viewed this same video. So in the end result, we have a more refined understanding of the subskills of leadership, plus a real-time application of these skills by Hannah uh, in an ordinary moment of her day. So it really has the theory and uh, the, the practice. Imagine a website such as YouTube, uh, just pull that one out of the air, where one could watch video clips of children engaged in intelligent behavior uh, doing, during ordinary moments of the day. And everybody could see these clips. If we use these public video clips as our database for creating our professional knowledge base, then I think uh, the profession would truly evolve. We could write about child development, we could write about parenting, we could write about teaching, we could write about learning, and then we could go to the database, select clips that exemplified what we were talking about, and then people could debate with us because uh, they would have a better understanding of what we meant by our writings. And I think the age of the image is certainly here, and text uh, will be a parallel symbol system, but not the only symbol system. So what if we had such a database? We could search it after we indexed it. Uh, we could discover new things about children. We could see what children actually do, what teachers do, what parents actually do. And we could even take video clips, lay them out in a string, and show longitudinally the development of some aspect of development itself. Uh, here's a mock-up of a searchable database. Uh, we used Extensis Portfolio to do this. 
and each of these thumbnails is a first poster frame of a video clip, and if you click on the clip, a uh, video launches. But at the bottom, you can also type in search words, and when you hit the return, all the video clips that have that keyword is returned. So here's what would happen if I... Okay, let's show the family. world your little bye-bye-bye routine. Here we go, dude. You ready? <laughs> We kind of discovered that one day, just playing around. So that's a type of babbling. It's not the only type. It's kind of supported by a playful adult. But if I had four or five clips that were returned when I typed in babbling, you could even see these nuances and get a clearer, more refined understanding of what textbooks mean when they say dab babbling is a precursor to, to speaking, natural language, and it is. Uh, if you follow the course of babbling, it too has its own course, and it sounds like sentences, and it has inflection. In fact, it has more inflection at the beginning than anything else. Uh, there's a book called Language in the Crib, and this mother video uh, recorded her child's babbling and actually uh, analyzed it. So anyway, that could be one use to see uh, development. Uh, by using a searchable database. So the clip itself becomes highly contextualized, shared definition of early language development, in this case, babbling. Uh, other video clips could show more spontaneous babbling, and there we could see useful nuances of this otherwise general term. Currently, this practice of sharing imagery is used in everyday conversation as we refer to a movie we saw or something on television like, oh, you mean cocky the way Paul Newman was in Cool Hand Luke? Or you might say, well, I'll tell you why I'm going to vote for Obama. Did you see his speech on racism last week? So we have these shared images because of broadcast images, and we cross-reference them as we try to understand uh, each other's meanings and motives. But they're not really an indexed database. Uh, these shared references do move us along in our debates because at least we're talking about the same thing. But we have no such iconic visual anchors in child development or early childhood education. Uh, we do have some good books that we all read and love and refer to and Vivian Paley's stories. Uh, but no video that I know of that we refer to. Uh, nor is there any accumulative or index knowledge base uh, that even come from watching movies and television. It's all sort of random and casual. But the internet can help. Once again, the internet has opened up new possibilities for creating a new form of knowledge and a new format for professional development. A knowledge that is rich both in theory and explanation, but mapped to visual examples. So note that I'm not talking about a book with a CD in the back with a lot of videos or even an e-book uh, that has embedded video. I'm talking about a public uh, video database. I'm not even talking about the occasional blog uh, that has videos for people to write. I'm talking about something that's constructed by hundreds of people, uh, a Wicca, if you will, managed online community, a Wikipedia of child development. This would be wonderful. A lot of people want it. It's very labor intensive. Somebody's going to do it. Uh, where experts, parents, and teachers can contribute keywords and comments to any video clip uh, that they watch. It could be searchable uh, in a manner that helps it grow both in scope and organization. I'm, we chose to make this proposal to Google because you're in the uh, middle of this uh, new age of searchable uh, assets. But what makes this powerful is the debate that it will yield, uh, the discussion that the video database uh, will encourage. This format will help us understand what other people mean and help us more constructively disagree. And it has great implications for cross-cultural professional development, understanding other cultures. So the, call it the democratization of documentation. Uh, the democratization of documentation has many ramifications. And I'm just naming a few. 
and then we're going to break for a Q&A. So uh, some of these bullets may be interesting to you, so uh, make, make a mental note if you would like. In uh, early education, there's this tendency to use kind of soulless standards. They're just sort of lists that are almost vacuous. Instead of using authentic uh, moments captured on video, indexed, and posted for everyone to see, we could change that. Uh, we could use video clips to document quality as opposed to uh, just scores on some kind of list of standards. Uh, and this would remove that distance between the raw data, the real experience that we have some intuitive understanding of, and the scores we read uh, as we evaluate programs and try to understand where the children are. Because numbers may be good for quantifying differences, but they're not really in and of themselves useful for understanding what it is you're counting. You have to have another source in video uh, because they're uh, tight and uh, searchable could provide it, an alternative to numbers. A browsable video database can be used to transfer knowledge from expert to novice in a manner that maintains this close mapping between theory and practice. A lot of young teachers have great courses in theory of education, theory of child development. They have really good practical experiences, but the two just aren't mapped together. They can't apply their theory when they get into the classroom because they didn't learn theory that way. They learned it from textbooks. They didn't learn it as an overlay to real examples, and video combined with text could marry theory and practice. And parents uh, would watch these video clips, we hope, but not to find a rainy day activity, but to observe how children learn, the unfolding of how children think as they play. So, uh, and we maintain that this image of the child, the understanding and learning to observe is important for being an effective parent, not just knowing what toys to buy and what materials to have available, but how to look at what your children do as they play. So to summarize, here are the statements we made earlier. And again, you can use these. We'll go through these kind of quickly. Plays defined as by a casual attitude toward activity. Success is achieved by practice and defined by attaining goals. Understanding is achieved by reflection and requires knowing what something is not. And then here are the four statements we used to analyze Frank and Tyler about how it improves performance. Play explores the as if. Play wishes for surprise. Play is unperturbed by failure. A play delights in recombinations. And our final big picture anchor statements about play. Success without play will not yield understanding. Uh, success, uh, excuse me, success without understanding will not create meaning and love of work. And finally, understanding without sharing will not create quality. So to wrap up, consider this statement, that success without understanding will not create meaning and love of work. We want our children to balance work and lightheartedness, nothing without joy, to combine success with purpose, to develop a knowledge of how their work contributes to their sense of self, a self-centered in the context of one's social and physical space. And play helps to define work in this view from above, uh, using a view of the pattern of what I'm doing and thereby giving it meaning and satisfaction to work. And you may know the book by Daniel H. Pink, A Whole New Mind. I, I recommend it, uh, why the right brainers are going to inherit the world. Uh, you can, can take or leave the subtitle. But anyway, uh, he states in this book, uh, playfulness is showing itself to be an accurate marker for managerial effectiveness, emotional intelligence, and the thinking style that deals with holes and patterns. And he goes on to say in his book, the workforce of the future will need these right brain skills more than in the past. So, just to conclude, when you watch a child skip instead of walk, acknowledge that as a path to Harvard.
So now we uh, would love to hear your reactions, your contributions, your stories, your ordinary moments, uh, because uh, we have uh, plenty of time for whatever questions you might have. Working in a, a professional way with children. Do I have some teachers in here? OK. And uh, parents that aren't working with children. And so are any non-parents non-teachers here, you know, Googlers? OK. Great. Uh, this, we think, will be on YouTube. And we hope to set it up. I don't know how we can, but I hope we can set it up as a way you can dialogue with us after you've uh, gone to YouTube, or you can go to our website. Do you have the question? And the wife, the HANA? Yeah, yeah. Peacefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's important. With her structure, I think the play has a flow. Right, but what, how, what would you do differently as the adult if you start recognizing conflict? Right? Conflict? If the person that got banished into underneath the stair, right, <laughs> because he was sick, if he started kind of being, uh, showing conflict, saying, no, I don't want to do that, what would you do as an adult to continue to the theme going? Does that make sense? Yes, of course. I'll take that question as, um, that ha comes up not infrequently uh, in, in a school. Uh, and I think our tendency is to let the play develop because the chil we find that when the children are given the time and the space, they can negotiate conflict. They have the tools. Uh, and so knowing that Hannah is the leader of the play, if some of the participants in the play are um, seen by her to be re uh, reluctant to continue in that vein, then she may, and I think she does in some ways, edit the script. Did you notice? So she invites him to come out and, and I don't think that's working. And have and eat at the table with the others. I think that, that she's sensing and um, we've awesome. found that the more we don't jump in to the activity and, and stand back and and, re, and provide res, uh, support, but not become involved in the um, in a, a, temp, a potential altercation, that the children will surprise us, and um, more and more we come to understand that they do have these skills for negotiating with one another. Um, and then the children sometimes, if they're not, um, if the play isn't going along the way they want, then such such same as William, who um, didn't want to be the doctor, they'll walk out of the play and then maybe return with a new role in mind as he came back as the cooker, uh, or they may leave the play and, and not and not stay. So um, we've got lots and lots of video uh, on the website that talk about children entering play. Uh, how do children enter the play? We think about how children maintain the play, how children negotiate within play, uh, and how children protect the play, and then the roles of leader and the roles of the child who's, you know, in, in the play but not directly um, leading the play. So it's, it's very exciting and interesting to follow. Uh, and if we watch, stand back and watch and then document and then look again, we get a lot of information, I think more so than if we jump in. So. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. How long has your study been going? Why don't we give her that yeah. one? Can, this one works, I think. Well, no, that one works too. This one works too. Oh, it does? This one works, yeah. Oh, right, say something. Oh, hello. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm just curious, uh, so how long have you been studying this um, children play Children's play. Who, who us personally? Yeah. Uh, Thirty-three years. All right. Uh, but do you think that makes a difference? Uh, <laughs> probably not. I uh, see. I, I, answer, I ask that question seriously because I hope it doesn't. I think uh, we encourage uh, parents and teachers to slow down and look, and we find that when they do, they see incredible things. Particularly if I sometimes teasingly say I don't learn from watching children. I learned from watching video of children because I can slow down. And there's a, you need good tools of mind to do good work. But everybody's got video cameras now. So I think if I'm maybe going slightly beyond the motive of your question, I would say, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. But I don't think one has to get a PhD in cognitive development to uh, see uh, the elegance and the high-level thinking in play. 
I'm, I'm counting on it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sometimes it's just being given permission to slow down and observe. Uh, I think professional educators sometimes feel like if they're just watching the children, they're not doing their job. And uh, parents also feel that, oh, if I just watch my daughter or son, I'm not really helping them grow. Uh, but you're going to do a worse job trying to help them if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, so I always say you make a parallel entry into the pot child's play. You watch the child for a number of minutes. You get an idea of what they're doing, and then you enter uh, not head-on or perpendicular, but like you enter a causeway, you know, it's kind of a it's parallel entry. I have, an, I have another question. So yes. uh, it's very interesting because I know thanks to the teachers here at, at Google, right, I've uh, begun to understand better kind of the value of play, success, et cetera. And you introduced kind of understanding as a new element there that I hadn't been thought of before. And I know at least with my kids, right, I've never really taken into account reflection, which you've mentioned, to yeah, yeah, kind of look yeah. back and talk to them, well, what did you do? How did you do it, right? I just wanted to know if you have tips to help with the reflection. Like as an example, my kids uh, suddenly started liking to do puzzles, right? And so after they Jigsaw finished, puzzles? Jigsaw puzzles, yeah. So I've been getting- With fine. a form board or without a form board? Uh, you put them in a space and a- Oh, it's just an empty, like, you know, 24 pieces jigsaw puzzle. And oh, then they no, just no form board. No, no. Wow. So they just look at a picture and they're doing it together, okay. right? And so I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. But how can I use that, uh -huh. seeing that they like the puzzles and use the reflections up nice. to help with their play success? Uh, that's a very good question. I actually spend a whole summer in a micro bus going from school to school watching children put jigsaw puzzles together as part of a research project. Uh, and Alan, uh, you know, help out on this. Um, see, I have a style, and uh, it, it has a it has a long history. I mean, it comes from. Uh, a theory of, of, of teaching and, and learning. It's based on the importance of um, being confused. And so um, w what I try to do paradoxically is try to confuse the child uh, uh, in, a, in a, what I think is a constructive way. Um, for example, uh, we gave children jigsaw puzzles that are you buy uh, but uh, uh, some, some of them, we took that jigsaw puzzle and we painted the picture on some masonite and uh, we cut it up so that the shape of the pieces no longer fit the shape of the elements in the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, so if there was a hat uh, shape painted on the piece, the hat piece was somewhere else. So the contour no longer matched the... So it made them think just a little bit more. So sometimes you can, you know, give them something that's just a little bit more difficult. Or we gave them a jigsaw puzzle where all the pieces were the same shape. They were all kind of hexagonal. And the little kids would put it together, and it was all scrambled. It looked like scrambled eggs, and they were just as proud as they could be. Because their task was to get all the pieces in the form board, but... You know, when they're a little older, they realize the objective is to reconstruct the picture. So, or I might give them a piece that doesn't fit and see how they accommodate. You don't have to say anything. Uh, you just sort of by changing the uh, task a little bit, uh, make it uh, slightly harder. But I wouldn't go the route of giving them a, a piece with more pieces. That's kind of silly. You know, they're doing a 24-piece jigsaw puzzle. I wouldn't give them a 36-piece just to say, oh, that's harder. I would think about the strategies the children use and how the change in the jigsaw puzzle draws on new strategies. The other th thing in terms of your question about reflection is that we try have been trying um, or challenging us ourselves when we're talking with children to stay close to the action 
So to think about what they're doing instead of the, the end product. So um, maybe to clarify a little bit, the tendency would be, you know, what is this a puzzle of? Or what are you making? Wow, you, you know, the bus is, you're making a bus. And, the bu and then what color is the bus? And talking about the, the noun, what it is and what it looks like. But what we have tried to challenge ourselves to do is to try to talk more about the action. Because a child is busy doing something. So we want to stay close to that and ask about, if, oh, you turn that piece around. Do you think that that piece might fit better if you turn it? Or you know, a reflection on what the child is doing or what the child might be doing to help with the puzzle? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, sometimes. Kind of running there right and then waiting until the end. Kind of narrate as mm -hmm. it's doing it. Yeah. So, Right. So we're, we're, so we're the child is busy doing something and we're reflecting on that action. So reflection on action versus reflection on the product, you know, the end piece. And that's just another, another idea that you might want to think about when you're yeah, working. Trying to stay away from asking questions, though. I mean, you can make declarative statements like, oh, I noticed you turned that piece around. That's it. But what you want to do is to bring to consciousness the strategy the child is using. Mm -hmm. Oh, I noticed you were jamming that piece in and didn't fit. Not uh, so much, tell me what you're thinking. You're not going to get anything. By the way, they're playing anyway. They don't want to pause to answer your questions. They want to play. So, so you just, you're there, you're, you get in their head and say out loud your guess as to what they're thinking. Uh, you don't say, oh, you're thinking that if you turn that, it's going to fit. I mean, you don't have to go that far. But you say, oh, you turn that. You choose what to say because you think it's a strategic move they made. It's related to something that's high level. Interesting. But I think, I think we've always thought that as a kid's playing, you're supposed to say something like, oh, what's that you're doing? You mean no. it's, it's wrong to ask those yeah, kind of things? <laughs> that's really funny because I've been doing that from day one. I know. Don't ever say good job. <laughs> don't say good job. Don't ever say okay, we gotta like have another kid and start from. No, no. <laughs> don't ever say good job because then the game is all about pleasing you, and it takes the child's attention away from their task. Say, oh, you rotated that piece, and if they rotate it, it's this. They know that's success. That means you. You don't want it to be about you. You want to be in there mental space flowing with them and not really distracting them, but raising the consciousness of what's happening anyway. Okay. As soon as you say good job, you've lost it. Like, for instance, my son, he's uh, four and a half, and lately he's really been excited about doing what he calls experiments. Okay. And he'll be, you know, in the bathroom, in the sink, and putting, like, cups on top of bigger cups with water flowing over it all oh, like and he'll say mama i'm making an experiment do you want to come see my experiment so i'll just watch him but i usually say something like so what do you think is happening <laughs> so what would you do to like really encourage that or well you know, you know water play is great because it's fluid and it changes and you can say things like oh when you put the block over there i see the water went two different ways you make a declarative statement about what's happening they draw the inference about how neat that is, or they put it to memory. They, what children need to learn to do is to encode their experience. That's where intelligence comes from. You don't learn from experience. You learn from reflection of experience, and you learn from encoding experience, and you learn what the pattern of experience is. And declarative statements help children encode their experience. So whatever's going on, you might come to yeah, you might do something and say, oh, that time I moved it over and it, it, it fell. I mean, you can play, too. But if the child is already finished and is coming to you for look what I did, yeah, you say, oh, that's sweet. Mm. Um, one more question I had was uh, about the um, essay, the Princeton Review essay. Yes. So you said that relates to play or play is good for something like that because it teaches you how to write with imagination? Well, you know, it's another way of saying a particular uh, slant on how to be creative. Uh, and, and I think what you have to do is quit uh, worrying about this kind of accurate rendering of your experience. Uh, back off. Uh, think about, you know, analogies and be playful with it. I mean, one way we define play, what it was, is kind of distancing yourself from product and kind of trying this and that. And then using some of the things you invent through playfulness, it makes it more interesting. Uh, but 
you know, we're kind of taking the word play and morphing it into the way uh, uh, English teachers talk about writing. It's not a forced fit, though. It's just kind of we're using the vocabulary of play to talk about uh, literacy. Yes. Um, so this is really interesting to learn that, you know, it, it isn't always good to sort of be emphasizing how great it is, what, they, what the kids are doing. Um, there is a lot of literature out there, though, about how um, that's how you build confidence and self-worth of the child. And, you know, when they sort of go out into the big bag world, this is the kind of stuff that they're going to remember that, oh, they're really great. And, and that's how they pick themselves up when they fall and so forth. And I, my baby's just a year old, so I'm very new to all this. So would you elaborate some more on how you can achieve that as well? And then secondly, are there other things that you see you know, parents doing that are, that would be sort of natural, would, you know, it's quote unquote natural to us, which is actually mm -hmm. not very helpful mm -hmm. to, to the children, because yeah. I'd yeah. like to avoid that. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful question. Uh, yeah, it is. The, the, all these questions have been wonderful. And I think one of the things that we talk about, even in our work in the school and also uh, with parents and, and work at home uh, and living at home, is about authenticity. So it's really about what's real. I mean, if you, and this is how I feel, and George may or may not agree, but if you see your one-year-old doing something that's stellar to you, say, wow, that's amazing. I mean, that's, if it's authentic, if it really comes from where you are, but often we get to the point, and the children know it, that we're just, you know, that's great, oh, that's wonderful, and it becomes almost a cliche, and it becomes, to the child, white noise in some ways, because it, it's not, it's just, it's something you do, you see, you see uh, something that the child is working on, and then you comment, that's wonderful, but it, but, but if, it, if it's really exciting to you, then yeah, go with it, that's how I feel, and then uh, going along with that, even with reflections, I mean, ask the questions that you you know, would want someone to ask you while you're doing an activity or while you're engaged in an experiment. You know, what, what, what are you curious about? What are you wondering? And what are you thinking about what your child is doing? And, and make those conversations. But sometimes it seems like we do, um, we find that we do talk to children in a different way. And so we comment, you know, for, I always talk about this kind of noun talk and itinerary talk, but the noun and adjective talk. So, you know, I never would encounter one of you in the, you know, in the halls at Google and say, you know, it's really nice to meet you and I really love your sweater or, you know, I, or what color is your shirt today? But we, but we ask children sometimes questions that don't go along with the re did, yeah, you're, you're, I hear a chuckle because it's, it's true. We just, we ask them questions and then at a certain point, we know that they know that we know the answer to those que that they know the answers to those questions, but we're still asking them. So uh, some of it, I think the word authentic t keeps coming into my mind. Make it be authentic. Like I'm sitting next to you and I'm really wondering and I'm really thinking about what you're doing and it's and and sometimes and it's incredible and I want to say it, but it, if it's real, you know, if it really comes from inside. Uh, we'll give you a reference. It's kind of an old one, but I think it's still uh, uh, opportune. Uh, Heim Gnott, do you know it's G-I-N-O-T-T, -T, between parent and child? I still see it in Barnes & Noble. And he has a chapter in there. It's called The Case of the Flying Ashtray. And it's about a parent who had just turned back to their child in the back seat of a car on a long trip saying, oh, you're so wonderful. And... Uh, then the child takes the ashtray and flings it into the front back then where everybody was smoking. <laughs> flings the ashtray and then the mother asks Dr. Gannat, why did the son do that? Well, it turned out that when the mother turned around and said, you're so wonderful, uh, the boy was thinking about, wouldn't it be great if there was an accident and the car was split down the middle and the brother sitting in the front seat would be killed but the mother and father would survive and he would survive and it'd just be he and his mom and dad. So he wasn't feeling too good about himself when this great generalized expression came back, you're so wonderful. But if the mother had turned around and said, you're being very quiet, uh, thank you. 
he couldn't really deny that, and it doesn't really uh, create anxiety about his bad thoughts. I think the problem with some of our praise, it's so general that the child doesn't really know what you mean by good job. Is it because you finally finished it or because it looked like, or what is it? But if you say to a child, uh, wow, uh, uh, there are four now that are in the stack. And the child knows they've been doing three for a long time and he was really trying to get that four. Uh, now the child makes the inference. I know what I did. Uh, my parent observed me close enough to know what it is I was trying to do, so I feel like I have a real audience here that understands me. And I don't need my parent to give that broad general statement, good job. Uh, I deduce that. And it empowers children. You're talking about self-concept. It really comes when children feel they're empowered to be competent, not when they're dependent on you for telling them when they're competent. So the more specifics you give about their competency, the better they feel. I think that's Gannat's sort of position. But it's, it, it has a lot of nuance to it. I could say one more thing, just because um, we had uh, a lot of examples of George's son, Jed, and my son, Sam, when he was three years old, was talking to me one day, and my, my mind was filled with other things, as all of our minds are often filled with, and, uh, and you know, he, ca he repeated something he'd said before, and I said, Sam, I hear you, and he said, well, you are hearing me, Mom, but you're not listening to me, and I think that, in some ways, can can encapsulates it. We want our children to know that we're, we hear them, and we're also listening to what they're saying, listening to what they're saying, listening to what they're doing, and responding in kind. So again, that idea of being authentic. I wanted to know when you go out in the world, you're just at the grocery store, you're walking by a park, and as experts in watching children and knowing what helps them to grow, what is the one thing or a couple of things that you see parents doing that you <laughs> wish you could walk up to them and say something about, but you never would? No. Uh -huh. oh. That's a setup. <laughs> one, one, thing, one thing I'm particularly sensitive about, because I had an older sibling that used to do this to me all the time, is to undo my initiative. Uh, now, you have to be careful, because you're in a grocery store. You can't do just anything. Uh, now, I'm from Massachusetts. and uh, It's, I think, like no other place in the world. It looks like parents have all read the parent guides. So in the grocery stores in Amherst, where I live, uh, if a child, you know, is asking 100 questions, the parent will answer every single question, you know? They're right in there. But it's because they really want uh, their children's initiative to be heard. But then I think in some uh, towns, I've heard that this happens, uh, the parent will say, quit asking so many questions. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, everybody has their limits, but that's one of my little <laughs> pet uh, answers. What are some of yours? I don't know. I don't call the grocery store. You don't call the grocery store? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should I tell them about your stove? Uh, no. No, okay. I was, let's see. I have to get some thought, but I, I think this idea of thinking together with children, I, I do think, George, I would piggy, piggyback on what George is saying, this idea of we do tend to give children the answers, and not because we're hurried, but often because we expect that a question will yield an answer, and that sometimes thinking together about what could be the answer of that, of, to that question and coming up with some ideas, um, and not necessarily doesn't have to be in a grocery store or a public place, but this idea, again, of sitting together and really brainstorming, and also thinking, and this kind of maybe off the, off the question, but thinking aloud. I think a lots of times we, and we challenge ourselves at the school to think with the children. So we will also talk about what we're, how we're thinking about something. Like I'm wondering, or I am curious about this, or I wonder if we did it this way, because you really are, you know, if you maybe turn the cups upside down under the running water, what might happen? So, you know, it's again this idea of thinking together with the children. And then the children, the idea of, of um, opening up your minds and, and speaking about your strategies and your theories together, then you become 
what we call partners in the play, partners in the learning, thinking together, learning together. Um, but lots of times, I think as adults, we do a lot of, because we would talk inside of our heads, you know, we don't, whereas children, young children, as they're taught, they work and they talk. And we have this self-talk that we sometimes omit some of the steps, some of our thinking, and, and then we lose the thread of a conversation that we could have with children. I know another thing, uh, and I've uh, actually done parent workshops on this one, uh, where, uh, and parents realize this, they can't seem to sit on their hands. They, uh, if a child is doing a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and uh, we videotape parents playing with the children, and they say, oh my goodness, my hands were always in there. I wasn't letting this child, wasn't letting my child uh, figure it out on his own. Uh, that's a common mistake. I think, again, parents feel like they have to be active. Uh, that, you know, oh, I remember my father taught me how to fish, so I'm going to teach my child how to fish. And you get out there and, and you make it kind of onerous and didactic. And uh, whereas, of course, my father <laughs> was different. He would take me fishing and uh, he would do nothing. And, but I learned how to fish. I, it was my an apprentice way. I, kids learn by watching. And we learn about kids by watching them. So I think uh, to kind of back off a bit and realize that observing is an important, important part. Not just observing, but uh, interpreting. And that's where, you know, other parents can come in and uh, why we like to talk to, about video, because we share our interpretations. Yes. Oh, here, yes. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering, uh, as an expecting father, oh, uh, wow. my wife and I are expecting in October, um, if you guys provide any resources or make any re recommendations, perhaps on your website, about uh, earlier development uh, for, for newborns and so forth, for play, and maybe even through the toddler stage and in late, later on into life. I know in the, at the beginning of your presentation, you said play doesn't stop in, yeah. in adulthood, and I love that. Well, our video goes from like six months. Uh, I would say our youngest uh, clips are six months, uh, all the way up to six years. So, you can be with us for six years if you like. But write us. Uh, yeah. uh, well, here, <laughs> anybody else that wants one of these, particularly for expectant parents, and I'll put these here if anybody else wants them. But we love email, and, and we answer it. So like your question about, uh, you know, good job, we, we'll dialogue with you about that. Because it helps us uh, help others, having, as Ellen says, authentic dialogue with parents and teachers. How do you deal, deal with frustration? How do you help a child cope with frustration? So they're playing, they're doing a jigsaw puzzle, can't get a piece in, they're like, I can't do this, this is hard, I don't want to do this. How do you encourage them along? Because you know, part of the thing for long-term success is overcoming those frustrations, dealing with them, right? And continue playing, perseverance. Can we talk a little bit about lending knowledge as an adult? So if we need to lend our children this knowledge in order for them to get over a possible frustration, um, we do it. But it, again, it's authentic. It's that we, and I think that it's if you, you see that the child is becoming so frustrated and just a little bit of a hint um, would help the child go forward in their learning, then do it. And you know, George actually was the one who taught me that once in, you know, when he's observing the school and he said, you know, it's okay if the child is stuck and in order to learn something, they need, a, they need your support and your uh, knowledge, go ahead and do that. You know, so I think, I think it depends on the child, it depends on the situation. And as you get to know children, your own children, and as we get to know the children in our schools, we can see when the child is getting to that point that I can't do, you know, it's too frustrating and I'll just walk away from it. If we want to help them, that's why we say supporting the children, but uh, the ch child is leading, but we're supporting them. And sometimes we have to take the lead for a moment. Um, knowing that we're sharing our knowledge with them and they'll be sharing their knowledge back with us. Uh, and you have to sort of step back and think why uh, it's important for the child to be successful. Again, we said, you know, play is not so much about success. Uh, sometimes a task or a game uh, gets to be a cause, and that's a little dangerous. Uh, when, like, children at age seven, they get into this very literal stage of drawing, and if their drawings don't look like what 
thing they're trying to draw, they get really frustrated. Uh, it's, it's called the literal stage. Uh, that usually passes. But as much as you can, and it may be by you leaving the room, uh, uh, try to have the child reconnect with uh, just the free fun of it. Um, the thing about puzzles, though, they really have a clear finish. You know, you know when you've done it, and you know when you have it. Uh, it could be that if you could find activities that don't have such a clear goal, it might be better, uh, like blocks uh, that are open-ended, and you can do a lot of different things with blocks. Yes? Um, my question is about uh, siblings, and, you know, my one is four and a half, the other one's two and a half. They both think that they're the exact same age, and they want to do, you know, the exact same thing. And and uh, when, like, for instance, at the end of the day when I'm picking them up from school, they'll both want to talk to me. And I've noticed lately the big thing is they both want to talk at the same time. And so I'm trying to figure out a way to, like, how to both of them being heard, you know, let, ha, showing them that I'm, I'm hearing both of them, but they both want to talk at the exact same time. And you can't just tell the one to be quiet so the other one can talk. So I'm, I'm just, like, having this... Really well, have Monday, dilemma. Wednesday, and Friday one child, <laughs> and Tuesday and Wednesday. I mean, you, something specific like that's my own very practical suggestion. I mean, right there when they're both wanting to talk to the same. Yeah, yeah. Is there a well, way to I like... mean, sure. Say it's Monday. You you got to go second. <laughs> well, that's what I would do. Really? I mean, but that doesn't come from any, you know, thirty-three years of <laughs> just kind of what I thought of when you asked the question. What would you do? Yeah, I have it. Uh, you know, sometimes um, having a finding a solution in the in that moment when there's tension is more difficult. So I guess my, what I would do, and what we often will do at the school when there's an altercation or there's something similar to this, um, all the children want us to talk at the same time, let's say when you're sharing something and mm -hmm. together in the morning, um, is to talk about the situation before it happens again, after it happens, but before it happens again. So this, to me, would be a quiet night, you know, before bedtime. Um, and again, this is the idea of parent, adults talking about what they're thinking. Like, I'm, I'm concerned that every, when I pick you up at school, I love to see you both, but you both want to talk to me at the same time, and I don't think I can really pay attention to both of you at the same time. What's a good solution? And we know that from, you know, all of the leadership courses that we've taken that the best thing to do in terms of solution, finding a solution is to get the players involved. Mm -hmm. So you, that way the children become part of the solution and then we see that, the, that these the rules that children make together in a classroom or at home are the ones they follow because they were part of creating them. So again, this, you know, opening up and saying this is a problem for me and I know it's a problem for you both. What if we all sit, you know, talk together and find out what we might want to do, and they might come up with the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday I'll solution. Like answer better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I've heard in the past from someone else that said it's really good to enforce family rules, and so whenever something like that would happen, then you would say, no, remember our family rule is yeah. today you're going to talk first, then tomorrow on Tuesday. <laughs> and they'll remind each other, yeah. too, because they, are, they were part of creating the, the solution. Okay, thanks. If they're at that age where they can do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got another question. Good. Does anyone else? <laughs> um, so, here, so, so you know, it's part of the play thing, right? So, um, my son is two and a half years old. My daughter's four and a half years old, right? So, you know, there we say, oh, let's draw a house, right? So, my son starts, you know, squabbling stuff, right? Scribbling stuff. My daughter draws a nice house, right? And I said, oh, William, that looks good, right? I see you're coming along with the house, and then my daughter goes. No, that's not a house. That's a horrible, that's a, he just squibble squabbling, right? Uh. And so how do I kind of, you know, because she's putting down my son, right? Yeah. You know, but I want to, and for, oh, yeah, he's trying, you know, create, he's trying, he's trying his best. Let him, you know, do his imagination, et cetera. How would you handle that situation to either one, you know, tell, get my daughter to shut up and yeah. <laughs> stop saying such bad things, right, about my son, or two, you know, still, um, you know, have my son continue doing what he's doing because he's, you know, two and a half years old. So the two and a half is scribbling and the older child is saying it's not a house? Yeah, it's like, and, that's not And a house. you call it the house? 
Well, I said, well, yeah, he's trying his, he's trying to draw a house. And why did you say that? Was he trying to draw a house? Yeah, because he says this is house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Interesting. See, we, we, when I work with drawing with two and a half year olds, I don't talk about objects they're trying to represent. I talk about the marks themselves. Like, oh, look at uh, the way you make that those lines curve over each other. Or I make some descriptive comment about the marks themselves and how the marks relate to the other marks. Like, oh, you did a scribble and you drew a line straight through it, which is characteristic of at that age. And when you start, if the child hadn't volunteered the house, you know, uh, then what I'm saying makes more sense. If the child says the word house, he says, he, I would say to the child, it doesn't look like a house to me. I would. And then again, this is because it, and I don't really, I, I want children to think about the readability of their mark. You can say, um, I would, I would, or better yet, I would, I would just sort of let his comment, the house, go by the way, and then try to have this mark conversation. If you email me, I'll send you an article that I wrote called "Helping Children Ask Good Questions," and it's about drawing and what what we can say when children make marks and how it may uh, have them reflect on what what they're doing uh, because. It, representation is not really what they're about. And they say those things just to please you, my guess is. They call it a house. Uh, but probably what he's really having fun with and reflecting about is how, you know, all these things look like a big squirrel or something kinetic about it, but, but not this mark stands for this referent out in the real world. I don't believe it. That's interesting. So my, he's drawing, he goes, look, look, daddy, house. Yeah, my daughter I goes, think he's, no, it's he's not, just trying so. to be a good, good son. I think it's a social thing. I, I wonder, is it because the four-year-old may be drawing a house already? Yeah. And yeah. he's drawing a house with his wife. It, there are a lot of reasons like that, but my guess is if we could get in his head as he's making the mark, he's not thinking house, 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 house. He's saying, oh, wow, look, if I keep doing this, I can cover up the whole page. There's something he's thinking. And that's where I would hope we would go rather than what he says because of the social context. And you're kind of projecting your interpretation of how he might feel about what she's saying. He yeah. may not even feel, he may not even be experiencing hurt or... Well, actually he is. Cause being he's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> he is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Uh, in the house. In the house. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, he's that's objecting, kind of a right? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get away from that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it. <laughs> Still have to practice. Actually, well, I honor, have... honor that this is a new kind of mark. Like, wow, I've never seen you make marks like that before. They're really swirling. That's, that's, that's something. That's uh, not uh, random what the child is doing. And sometimes it is the result of this culture that we do, though I was saying before, that we have created where we're asking, constantly asking children, what are you doing? What are yeah, you making? Yeah. What are you doing? So if this child, if, if your son has heard, if you, ha if you create something, it has to have a name because people keep asking me what it is that I'm making. That's the noun talk. Then the noun talk. But if the, if the, if, if the culture is one in which the child's marks are being reflected on the car child's actions, more than what the child is making, then they don't feel compelled to have to give it a name all the time. So, I mean, it, it could be. This is just speculation, not knowing for sure. You know why yeah. a marker is so profound as a cultural object? It leaves a record of movement. That's what children are playing with. I move my hand in the air and there's no residual. I move a chalk on the blackboard and there's what I just did. That, that's how my hand just moved. Wow, it's still there. And that's why marks are so profound. Not because they represent houses, but because they represent the movement you just made, or you continue to make, or you stop and you start. It's like reading footprints in the snow. And that too is a kind of literacy. To read marks to understand, what did I do to generate that set of marks? That's literacy. It doesn't have anything to do with houses. 
Actually, so um, the, the question and, and this discussion actually reminded me of a, of a funny uh, incident that, that happened with me that might actually hold some lessons. Um, I was a teenager and I was playing with my little cousin who I don't even know how old she was. She, she was a toddler and, you know, very young. And we were both coloring and we finished coloring and I looked at what she had done and her coloring was impeccable in terms of absolutely within the lines. And mine, you know, I thought was was pretty good but it actually wasn't as precisely within the lines as hers was and she looked over to me and she said well you tried you know <laughs> and you know that might be a good response that you know it may not you might not think that this is a house but you know he tried yeah. mm -hmm. and uh you know i definitely felt good that my little cousin was saying that my coloring job wasn't as bad as as apparently she had <laughs> evaluated so i think the body language says it's about time to wrap up thank you so much for your great can question. we just do a little round of applause just for the small group that's here <laughs> thank you thank you Thank you.